Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having oh, me. Fantastic. And thank it's... you for that warm welcome. Thank you so much. I'm Hi, guys. Gonna, I'm going to ask you, did you ever think you'd feature as part of the inaugural Global Freight Summit for DP World? I 100% I did. I deal with freight. I've got a, a company called Fate Fit where we distribute our protein snacks globally, and it's costing me a lot more to do so. So I'm, I, I'm aware of what's going on around the industry and I'm, I'm honored to be here with DP World right now to find out more about what's happening. Yeah, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Give us a bit of an insight in terms of that. Would you say as a customer, as a business using the global freight enterprise and network, what, what are some of the things that you might have to think about? Well, I, I got into uh, FMCG about four years ago when I decided to start a, a kid's snack company, which has now turned into a fairly large brand, which we're distributing across the Middle East and them to uh, other countries and I didn't really understand what distribution meant logistics I really never thought of that I worked on radio every day of my life there was no need for me to even think about this but now as I am paying to get my products to certain places and I'm um, trying to still keep my my revenue there um, I'm now getting more involved into find out finding out why prices are maybe higher here or lower there or importing dates or nuts where we import our products from around the globe. So I'm totally invested with it and I try to explain to the, uh, the consumer that sometimes companies like myself, we have to increase prices or we get to even lower our prices depending on what's happening globally, especially when it comes to the logistics. So I know it's a very important time right now globally where we are, uh, you know, after COVID, post COVID, but it's an interesting time. And again, I'm honored to be here and we've got some exciting guests joining Joining us. You know what, that's a really interesting insight you've just given us there because it just shows that entrepreneurs like yourself, you're plugged into the supply chain community. You bring that wealth of knowledge and expertise that really communicates with our audience here. We've had a wonderful audience. Day one kicked off really well. We've been plugging this session all day today. I'm sure you'll verify. So having this kind of synergy, I think it's really important. It shows why DP World has you know, invited you along for this wonderful concluding session. I can't I can't let uh, myself leave the stage without asking you, life beyond Dubai bling, how is it and how is your radio show doing? So I, uh, I do a radio show on Virgin Radio for people that aren't aware. Uh, it's a, it's a UAE-based show which goes across a few countries and I got the opportunity, Netflix approached and said, would you like to be part of a reality show? And initially I said no. Uh, and then after sort of talking back and forth, I decided to take the risk and jump in and it's called Dubai Bling. It's a, it's an unusual show. It's a reality show about a few members that live here in the UAE. It's currently number two globally uh, across the world, which is pretty remarkable. I did not expect it to do what it did. I don't think anyone did. Uh, the response has been overwhelming, especially from outside the country. Uh, more people saying that they want to come to Dubai, they want to set up business in, in Dubai. It really showed them a, a way that I don't think maybe the city had been seen before. So it's fantastic. I'm getting calls from Brazil, from Indonesia. Um, the story also shows a little bit of my brand, Fade Fit, the, the snack company. And as soon as the show went live, yeah, we had the likes of uh, Indonesia, South Africa, Brazil, and Australia now interested in getting our products to those countries, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to be part of it as well. I wanted to showcase what we're doing. So now I just got to find the distribution, the logistics to get it to the country. <laughs> if anyone here knows, feel free. Yes, great. See, you're you're great. in the right. You're in the right room. I have to say. So me, as I introduced myself to Chris earlier, um, we're part of the same media world. Massive big star, massive big geek, BBC <laughs> News reporter. Um, I don't watch reality TV, but I started to watch Dubai Bling. I've got to, I haven't finished it all, but I got to the scene really beautiful where you take your parents to Madame Tussauds and you're there and there's two Chris's. Today we've got one Chris, but all we need is one Chris because you've got so much energy. It's so wonderful to have you part of the program. And may I just say, off stage and off, on stage, such a gentleman. It's so lovely to meet people who are ambassadors of the UAE and a real credit to this place as well as fellow resident. And you know, we're embracing here by the Emirati community, we're embraced here by the international community, and we've got a wonderful audience who are really embracing everything that DP World are creating. So I know this session is going to be in wonderful hands. I'm going to be quiet now and hand it over to Chris. You've got a great panel, so I'm going to get you to invite them on. Thank sure. you, Chris. Thank you for your kind words. Please, a round of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank honored, you so much, honored, Chris. Honored. I Thank appreciate you. it. All right, we're going to have some fun. Any F1 fans in the crowd? Where are you? F1, where are you? Now I need you to make some noise. F1 fans, where are you? There we go. 
I like this. I like what we're doing here. Our next two guests are, are, are remarkable, and they help get the F1 underway. Without what they do, we wouldn't be able to watch it. And we know that millions watch it every single month, if not every single weekend. Our, one of our guests is somewhat on a reality show that has really transversed what the F1's all about. All of a sudden, 17, 18, 19, and 20-year-old females love the F1. Anyone watch the show, the show that I'm talking about? Netflix, anyone seen it? There's a few at the back, there's a few over here. We're gonna see what it takes to get the F1 around the world because these cars got to get shipped globally, right? They don't just appear in these certain cities. And as we're aware, what's happening in the capital uh, this weekend alone is pretty remarkable, but how did they get it from Brazil? And how do they bring it from Australia? That's what we're here to do. I'm honored to be here, of course, this afternoon with DP World. Again, my name is Chris Fade. Let's welcome our guests on stage. Firstly, the man. He is someone that you may recognize from Netflix, as I said, from the Formula One show, Drive to Survive. Please welcome the Chief Executive of McLaren Racing, Mr. Zach Brown. Thank you, Zach. We'd also like to welcome a man who knows all about moving complicated cargo around the world. And he does it very quickly. Please welcome Stephen Bing, Director of RPM Logistics. <laughs> Stephen, thank you. Take a seat, boys. You could be like a boxing commentator. I, I, ha I was just at the Mayweather fight doing this exact thing. <laughs> two nights ago in Dubai. Oh yeah, okay, there you go. So uh, firstly, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. We know that it's busy times for both of you. Uh, welcome to Dubai. Firstly, tell me, you're loving the city or what? You... Absolutely, it's, a, uh, it's awesome to finish uh, in, in this part of the world. We uh, also start in, in the Middle East, so it's a, a very important part of the, the Formula One calendar. And um, they put on a fantastic event here. Had a little fun today on the uh, Golf course, courtesy of DP World. Played with some guy named Roy McElroy. He's pretty good. Wow, are you serious? And uh, it was, uh, it's been great. It's great to be here. What's the handicap, can I ask? Uh, not as good as his. Okay, sure. Uh, 14. <laughs> I still have a job. I'm about a 48, so don't worry. <laughs> uh, Stephen, as well, welcome to the city. Welcome to Dubai. Welcome to uh, with you. here, DP World. Did you get a chance to play any golf today? No, I've, I've actually come straight from the track to here, and uh, yeah. No, all, all work, no play at the moment, but um, yeah, we're almost at the end of the season. So it, it's this time of the year that's obviously really, really important for, for many racers, for many drivers, for many clubs. Zach, firstly, I just want to switch to you. How are we feeling as we head into this Abu Dhabi race? How, how are you feeling? How's the team feeling? And personally, how are you going? Um, it's been a difficult year for us. We're, we're fifth in the championship. We're coming off of a, a bad Brazil. Uh, a, a double DNF, which is the first we've had since uh, Monaco a few years ago. Uh, Daniel had an accident at the start, and then uh, Lando had a, a, a clutch issue later on in the race. He was running okay. Uh, so one to go, 19 points out of fourth. That's a, a pretty tall order, but we'll, we'll give it all we've got. We're, we're usually pretty good around Abu Dhabi, and uh, since the championship's over, I think it's going to be a bit of a uh, free-for-all for, for everyone. So it's going to be a, a very exciting race. Depending on where you go around the world, is it, is it a different feeling, or is it always the same feeling going into a race? Does, does the city and where you're at and the atmosphere and the people, does it change, or is it always the same? Um, the intensity of the Grand Prix and, and the build-up, that's the same from a, a racer's perspective, but uh, all, all these great countries and cities that we race in, they definitely have kind of a different flavor. They're all uh, fantastic in that, you know, you show up, you're very welcomed by uh, the, the promoter of the country, the fans, they're all huge races, but you can definitely tell uh, the different parts of the world, kind of whether it's through the uh, cuisine or the evening activities or what time the race starts, uh, how long the race has been, a, been around, uh, then depending on who your drivers are and your team's history, you know, there, you go to Italy, that has uh, very much a, a Ferrari feel to it, as you would imagine. You go to Silverstone, it feels very McLaren. You go to Australia, where we've got one of our drivers from, but uh, they're, they're all fantastic events. Awesome stuff. Stephen, I want to just ask you now, moving interesting cargo around the world, you guys at RPM obviously do that, and you do it in the quickest possible way. 
How do you do it? What do you look for? Is there secrets that we should know? You've obviously been living this industry for many years. Tell us how you do it. I don't really want to give the secrets away, if I'm honest. But uh, <laughs> no, the, the key is, you know, firstly, understanding what the team need um, and you know, working back from there. But attention to detail is everything. And the world of shipping at the moment is, is just so erratic since... You know, COVID and with the Russian, uh, the Russian-Ukraine sure. conflict, um, and even even down to the you know the problem in the Suez with the blocked vessel, it just is kind of there's there's now so many moving parts and and we we're experiencing delays everywhere. So attention to detail is everything at the moment, and um, yeah, just is is planning really important, especially for complex sort of events when certain things are needed. Are you really planning? Yeah, we we we've. we've been planning for a month already for for next season, um, so there's no real there's no real shut off in terms of that. Um, just because you know after after this season finishes, we've still got kit coming back for for the teams, you know, to the end of January and into into February, and we we already need to start shipping out for the for the first event in December. So it's a, it's a constant overlap. So in terms of the actual shipping side of it, there's not. So really the, any the drivers can sort of have a bit of downtime. But you guys never stop. Uh, I mean, obviously, everyone, everyone's entitled to a break. We try our best to get it, but yeah, in terms of what we do, it never, it never, it never stops. Just because the season now is getting, it's getting so big, um, it's, it's just yeah, it's constant overlap, and and as well, you know, with with the teams trying to you know create more sea freight. Uh, you know, to reduce their, you know, for, for sustainability and reduce their, you know, their carbon footprint in terms of sending air freight. It's this, there's more kit that's constantly moving around the world, sure. and to try and move it in the best and most sustainable way for the team. What, what's changed since the pandemic? Post-pandemic, are, are things, are they harder? Yeah. Or, yeah. 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 In, in, what, in what essence is it harder? Is it, is, it a, is it one major aspect or is there multiple? I, I, think, I think the world of freight is still recovering. Um, it's, yeah, there, there's still, you know, there, there's, there still seems to be a lot, of, a lot of troublesome areas to ship to. Certainly, for, you know, places like the US in terms of vessels getting in and out and there's constant delays and backlogs of freight going in and out of the ports. And, I can see that happening for quite a while now, so um, sure. hopefully, obviously, you know, calm down at some point. But Zach, from your end, when it comes to McLaren racing, has there any been any logistical issues from your end because of the pandemic or post-pandemic? Now, were you experiencing things now differently? And how important, obviously, it is to get the car ready to go with all the things that you need for it to be race day. Uh, I'll start with the last part. It's, it's critically important. You know, these cars are constantly being developed. There's about 80,000 pieces that go into a, a Formula One car. If you're one short, you're probably not running your, your racing car. It's uh, exquisite materials from around the world. It's electronics. Temperature is critically important. So if you're at at sea or you're in the air, the way you uh, package up shipping engines would be different because of the uh, altitude, um, the electronics and all the data. You know, you can imagine, you know, seas are, uh, can be quite, quite rough. Um, so the way it's packaged is critically important. And in Formula One, the longer you can leave time to develop, the faster the race car you will have. So the uh, art and science for us is how late can you absolutely leave it to get there just in time. And it's amazing, you, um, a, a few years ago, a Formula One team uh, was late for testing because they didn't have some, some parts ready. I'm surprised that doesn't happen more often. Um, and it rarely, rarely happens in Formula One. And that can just be a, a part that, that hasn't shown up. We also, at a race weekend, we will be moving parts around Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And a lot of the times, we won't know that till Friday. So we had an issue in Monaco a couple of years ago um, where we needed to manufacture a new steering column because it was, a new, it was a new chassis, longer wheelbase, and we couldn't get around the hairpin properly. So we didn't know we even needed this part till Friday. The team stays up overnight back at, at the factory in Woking. 
manufacturer of the part, and then we have to get that part on the race car by Saturday morning. And that's kind of how Formula One operates. That's not that unique. So uh, for us, logistics, we were in Brazil last weekend. So to move you know, our, our show around, not just our racing team, but thousands of, of people. And then it's a combination of air and sea because sustainability is critically important to us. We're the first Formula One team to produce a sustainability report. So we're trying to be fiscally efficient. We're trying to be, uh, now that there's a cost cap in place, it, we need maximum performance and efficiency and as, be as sustainable as possible. And all that goes around the logistics of, of our show. You mentioned 80,000 80, parts for a, for, Formula an, one car. for a Formula One car. And out of that 80,000, when it's delivered, how many parts is it delivered in? Not 80, it's not 80,000. No, it, it, it depends what it is. Um, the more we can deliver it to the racetrack, ready to go on the, the race car, the, sure. the, the better, because we're limited on how many people we're allowed to have at a racetrack operationally, and then from a, a support and, and marketing standpoint. So uh, the less workload we can put on the racing team at the racetrack, uh, the better. And then a lot of our parts, because a lot of different uh, vendors work on them, they're flying around the world, so it kind of needs to be on Italy on this date, to Japan, back to England to all be put together to go race in, in Monaco. Who looks after this? Within, is there one person that looks after the party, the parts for the team? It, it's, it's much larger than, than one, one person. person, but we have a complete travel and logistics uh, department, <sighs> and, and you can just see we're constantly you know, coming and going and shipping containers. And are you personally across it? or Definitely you, not. Yeah, so you just rock up, but it, you'd be across it if there was a part missing, I'm guessing. Yeah, 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 100%. That's when you're stepping in. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's a well-oiled machine, uh, how these Formula One teams uh, operate. It's, it's, uh, it's very impressive, and you'll see at the end of the Grand Prix, we're already starting to pack up, so you'll see in the back of the paddock, yeah. you know, forklifts and everything starting to go into motion, because, uh, you know, we were racing in Brazil on Sunday, and the cars get rebuilt. So not only do we have to go from Sunday night to set up here on Wednesday, the car is getting torn down and rebuilt in, in the process. So, you know, there's not a lot of time. Sure, amazing. Wow, Did, it's interesting to see the back end and exactly how it all happens. Stephen, from your end, when, when you have certain urgencies, what do you do in that situation when you have more than, let's say it was a team coming to you for certain things, but then you have a number of different clients for other things coming to you. How, do you, how are you able to tackle those urgencies so quickly? I think, yeah, it, it, you've got to have the right team of people, which we have. Um, and over, you know, over the years, we've, 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 we've kind of taken on the right, the right key staff. Um, but you know, within what we do within the paddock for the F1 teams, um, you know, most, most, of the te most of the teams now, they're all going in the same direction. Um, and they all have similar urgencies, but yeah, it's just it's just reacting and, and but yeah, trying trying to foresee any possible issues sure. helps a lot. You know. And, and and Zach touched on the sustainable part. How has that affected the business? Sorry. The sustainability. So a lot of teams are now wanting to be more sustainable, as the McLaren guy is one of the first yeah. to do it. Yeah. So from your end, what are you guys doing? Is there a different way of? getting a, a car from one place to another to make it more sustainable? Yeah, I mean, for what we do with the teams, if you take, for example, you know, their, their garage, their sets of garage infrastructure and equipment, you know, they have multiple sets, but what we do is we try to work with the team to say, okay, you know, rather than bringing a kit home, if we can get it in time on a boat to the next event, that's what we focus on. Or, you know, for example, if you look at the calendar this year, the kits that went to Miami, you know, we kept them, kept them in the States, Rather than sending them home, we routed them up to to Montreal. Um, much more sustain, sustainable than bringing a kit home and sending another kit out. So, you know, at this point in the season now, we're already looking at a calendar for next year and, and working out okay, what what are the best options we can provide to the team and and, and you know achieve what they want to achieve. This question here says: Every second counts in the world of sport. What changes have you had to make? your operating model to meet the ongoing high demands of teams and their cargo. They're calling you high demanding now. That's what they're saying. 
Uh, are they obviously, uh, do, the, do the demands change from season to season? Are you finding that or from, yeah, from a mean, logistics if, point of view? If, if the calendar changes, then obviously you can't, you can't necessarily do a carbon copy of the year before. And every year, you know, F1 is trying to develop the calendar. So it's, it's really, you know, just trying to find the best option we can for each of them. And there is a high demand because, you know, as Zach said, by the time, you know, if, if, if you know, their kit has come from Brazil to Abu Dhabi, and their garage needs to be set up ready. So when that kit arrives, yeah, they can they can concentrate working on the car, which is really what they what they need to be doing to obviously you know ensure they give them the best chance of winning the race. But um, so for us, it's just yeah you know trying to just achieve and make sure everything's on time, building as many contingencies as we can, um, and find the best find the best solution for them. So the topic today is moving cargo in the 11th hour. We are honored to have you both here with us as well this afternoon. Thank you so much. Zach, does it change from season to season, the demands as well from what you need, or is it pretty much 95% the same and you make a few little changes here or there between seasons or can it drastically change? Yeah, it's, the calendar is expanding. You know, next year we're gonna have 24 races. Which... Do you want it from, from a... From a from a racing team, do you want more races? Because as a viewer, we want more races. We get to experience. It's great for tourism, for a city, but for a team, do you want more? Yeah, so I'd like to see more races, but alternating races. So I think uh, 24 races, which is uh, next year's calendar, I, I believe that's the max. I think we all kind of think that's the max because of how global sure. we are. Um, Formula One's working on making a more sustainable schedule. So, so we're trying to kind of, instead of going to Miami in May and then you come back to Europe and then you come back to Montreal. Sure. The problem is every uh, country or region, they have key dates, right? So if kind of what works here might not work for here. So I, I don't, I'm not uh, jealous of uh, Stefano, who runs Formula One, how difficult it is to, to put together a, a 24 race calendar. Um, what I'd like to see us is maybe at 22 races a year, but I think we wanna be in as many great countries that will have us, and, and we're fortunate that the demand is, is unlike I've ever seen before, but maybe 20 or 22 races where, say 16 of them are, are fixed, and maybe 10, you have on the calendar, but you rotate, you know, every five, that type of sure. thing, because you have, whether it's the World Cup or the Olympics, the big sports um, don't have to happen every year. So I'd rather see us in 30 markets, 22 times a year. Sure. I think that's the best of both worlds. Again, uh, easier said than, than done, but uh, that's how I'd like to see us expand the calendar without, um, you know, it's a lot of pressure on, on the racing teams and, and the people because it's, you know, we look at next year's schedule. We have, I think it's five races in six weeks, but the week off is in between Brazil and Vegas. You're not gonna fly back to Europe for your week off, so it's not really a week off. Now we need to start looking at what can we do with the racing team to kind of give them a week off without them going home. And so I think we're at the max. I think we can enhance the schedule, but I think we want to continue. South Africa wants a race. It'd be great to go back to India, uh, which, which had a race not long ago. Some very important markets, because um, there's no races I see now that I'd not want us to continue to go to. And I think that's the solution. When you were talking about sort of racing around the world, apart from Abu Dhabi, is there a favorite for you? Um, they're mostly all, all great. Uh, my personal favorite is, is Montreal. Um, it's a great city. It's got a lot of history. We've had a lot of success there. Yeah. Um, it's easy to get to. Uh, I love that. I mean, Singapore is great. Abu Dhabi is, is amazing. Uh, the, the Saudi race, the, the Bahrain race, uh, obviously Qatar, so you've got four uh, in, in, the, in the region. Uh, and then your traditional races, right? Your, your Italy, your British, 
your Monaco, and then now in America, Formula One is, is massively popular, and I think Las Vegas is going to be off the charts exciting. I know, well, yeah, Vegas, we obviously, we, we know it's got the, the you know, the, the casinos, and we're there for the UFC fights, and we're there for the boxing fights. Now we're going to be there for the, uh, the F1. The Formula One fights. Yeah, man, yeah, the Formula <laughs> One fights. What, what are you expecting? What are you expecting? I, I think it's going to be... Uh, stunning you know it's it's a city that's built for uh, entertainment uh it, it's I, I was out in vegas not long ago you know the the race is gonna i think start in front of the the fountains in front of the the bellagio so from a television spectacle standpoint las vegas lit up at night formula one uh, i think the the uh moving around for the fans will be easy because there won't be a lot of traffic because of all the all the hotels and uh, Formula One themselves are the promoters, so I think we'll try some stuff that we've not done before, which is what Liberty, who acquired Formula One about five years ago, have now done with things like Drive to Survive. So I think we're just starting to open up this great sport that has uh, billions of followers, but now we're, we're letting people inside, we're being more inclusive, and uh, I think there's a lot more opportunity there. I want to come back to the Netflix show, but I want to ask Stephen uh, first, do you have, a, a, from RPMs, is there a favorite track that you want to go to? Because it may be easier to get into. Silverstone. <laughs> yeah, okay. Fair enough. Apart, yeah. apart yeah. from Silverstone, what have you got? Uh, you know, f for me, one of my favorites always used to be Malaysia. I used to like you know, going to Malaysia. I always found it a fantastic place to go. Um, I like the circuit of, Amer of the Americas. That's probably one of my favourites, um, mainly for the barbecue food. <laughs> but um, food yeah. seems to be very <laughs> important for both of you. You get to travel the world, but it yeah. seems to be the food is also yeah. you get. You must get excited to just try the local food in that country. You've got to embrace the cultures and where you race for sure. I like that. Drive to Survive. We just touched on it briefly. Um, I think it's remarkable what that show's done. Uh, my radio producer, Nala, who's 24 years old, well, she was 24 when she started watching it, is the biggest F1 fan, the Formula One fan. And at first I was trying to work out why. Not that there was anything wrong with a 22, 23 year old female being a fan, but I was like, tell me why. And then she said, Drive to Survive, have you not watched it? Have you seen personally as well that it has just opened up a completely new demographic of fans to, the, yeah. to racing. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been amazing. I don't think any of us anticipated it being uh, as big as it has been. Uh, it's brought in a younger fan, yeah. which is great. You know, all, all of us want younger audiences. You, then you, you keep them around for, for longer. And it's brought in the, the female audience. So uh, about 75% of the new fans of Formula One have come from Netflix. Uh, it's made a huge difference, not only around the world, but specifically in, in North America. And uh, it's going as strong as ever. There's two more years left. We've been shooting again this year. And I think Formula One's such interesting content. Uh, people love it for the on-track competition, the gladiatorial nature of it, the global element, the technology. I think there's so many, the politics, it's big business. So I think there's a lot of personalities in the sport and there's a lot of different ways to engage with the sport. And I think that's what Netflix has done is it's kind of put it out there and then it's let people uh, kind of tune into Formula One in a way that excites them. And uh, it's been wonderful for a sport. Do you, do you think the show had something to play with it going to America or was that always on the cards? No, I, I think that that's made a, a huge a uh, huge difference, uh, the, the recognition, you, you just, you hear it all the time. It's, it's, it's the number one thing that you hear from people, especially people that are new to the sport. And what it's done is not just created awareness, it's made people you know, avid fans. Yeah, you're invested uh, in the, overnight. The, the teams, right? I, I, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, I never watched the Formula One, now I won't miss it. So, you know, normally the journey of kind of awareness and then a trend fan and then an avid fan, this has just gone from, I didn't watch it to an avid fan overnight and it's awesome. Can I ask, they, they do a lot of filming alongside you. Does, how, how have you been able to manage obviously doing what you do and having the cameras around. Are there times when I've recently was been on a reality show on Netflix and th there's cameras around you and sometimes you do want the cameras to just switch off for a moment, uh, but I, you don't have that luxury of doing so. Do you have parameters where when it's 
really heated or there's times where you just don't want the cameras around. Have you been able to balance that? Yeah, I, I think to produce the best show, we need to be, which we are, o open and, 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 and let, it, let it go. They, the production company, does a great job and they're now in team kit and they use these long booms. You kind of forget they're there and, and they do such a good job. So what you do do is every once in a while you, you forget your mic'd up and, and that's what they want that's because exactly they're, what they're, they they're, want. they're capturing it and um, we have some things if something's technically or commercially sensitive we can say hey you caught that we, we'd rather you not show that but we can't go in and, and edit it they, they grab the content and they grab a tremendous amount of content are the teams watching are all the teams watching it to see what the other teams are doing? Oh, are we're, always, uh, we're always watching what each other is doing. That's a big part of the sport. We're uh, listening to each other's audio. We're taking photography of each other's cars. That's why you see things covered up so quickly. A lot of the times, people won't realize when we do our car launches, we'll have parts on the car that actually aren't real parts because we know as soon as people start seeing it, they start analyzing wow. what, you know, what have they done on the floor, the front wing or the rear wing, and uh, we're trying to conceal that. So you'll see when a car breaks down in testing, first thing that happens is a car cover goes over it, and that's because no one wants to kind of see the underneath of the car, but we all eventually uh, figure it out. And then I think that's where AI will play a bigger role is we, we talk in code to the drivers, and so if you can imagine, a driver has about 300 adjustments on his steering wheel, about 30 different dials, all have about 10 parameters. So they're driving at full speed, attacking or being attacked or both, have all these settings on the car, being spoken to by their engineer, making adjustments corner by corner, and then we're asking them questions that we either want the real answer, so we'll say, you know, Lando, how, how are your tires? And he'll know that's a real question feed us back, or if we're trying to bait a team into maybe a, a, a different pit stop strategy, we'll want Lando to give us an inaccurate uh, response. So we might say, uh, Lando, tell us about the tires. Just a small different cue difference, and he'll know, ah, they want me to give them not the correct answer. So the driver's got to compute all of this at the same time while well, driving 200 miles an hour. It's amazing. Track. It's amazing. That is remarkable. So it's obviously very physical and obviously mental on both sides. Stephen, can I ask you, has there ever been an issue where you thought to yourself, logistically, I don't know if we're going to be able to do this one, but last minute you found a solution. And, and how did you find the solution? Has there, and I'm sure they come up where sometimes you can't meet the deadline. It's, it certainly gets tight moving kit between, between races and there's a lot of, um, you know, we put a lot of faith in the carriers, um, but you know, fundamentally, our, our, our planning is you know is on point. So I've, we've not really hit that 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 point yet where we've uh, you know, re really had um, you know any major concerns. But you know, as as the calendar gets a little bit bigger, then certainly next year is going to be more of a challenge. And you know, our, our job is our job is to 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 make it work for the team with. As, as few kits as possible. Yeah, you know, we don't want to. You know, in an ideal world, we could go to we could go to McLaren and say, you know, we you're going to need eight kits, eight sets of garage to to move a set to each race easily. But then, you know, get a set of garage kit is millions of dollars. So do you guys so, do, do the logistics side of talks to the team side and sort of helps each other out, or is it really just a a one way sort of track where you say, hey, we want this, we need this, get it done. From, from our from our side, yeah, we, we spend a, we spend a lot of time with the teams. You know, as soon as the calendar is announced or discussed, we start. You know, I'll, I'll sit down with uh, you know with Zach's guys and, and and you know start going through different options, what's possible, what's not. Um, and then you know, as, as the calendar gets more and more firmed up, you know, by that time there's a, there's already been quite a, a fair bit of advanced planning. Like I said, you know, we have a calendar now for next year, but we were already looking at that. Yeah, you know, some sure. time ago to try and see what's possible, and then we'll give the team an indication and say, look, you know, you could do it like this with five kits, but this is going to be a challenge. Or yeah, you know, if you have a six set kit, you can. And have prices it. gone up for you guys as well? Obviously, like, is there an increase of cost that will go onto the teams yeah. because of where yeah, we are yeah. post the yeah, pandemic? I mean, yeah, shipping shipping costs have, 
have gone up massively and um, yeah one of the biggest um, yeah certain, certainly um, yeah for example one of the biggest differences is shipping to and from the states you know, because not only have the shipping costs gone up but a lot of the shipping lines have implemented um, you know shipping guarantee fees which are you know one of the biggest bugbears for me because if you if you make a booking on a boat then they'll come along and say well if you wanted to go on that boat you know, it's another you know fifteen hundred dollars for example just just for, just because there's a backlog from the previous boat that's going to bump something off so um yeah fre freight costs around the globe have gone up massively wow. so um and then like i say that that has an impact on on, on, on Zach and the team because of their cost cap, you know, because there's obviously that, 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 you know, a lot of that goes under their cost cap, but then also, you know, the higher their freight costs, the less they've got for development of the car, and um, so, it's, yeah, it's trying, trying to find the most sustainable, economical... And I just get on TV and turn it on and watch it and just enjoy a good race. Yeah. We don't get to sort of truly understand the, the, the integral parts of what yeah. happens every single race day it's like a domino effect you guys must trust your teams on both ends from the logistical side of it and also from your team everyone has a role everyone plays that role and uh, zach from your end is it just i always think of it like a salesman if he's selling well and he's making budget and he's doing his thing we leave him alone and that's his job is that the same sort of way they just get the job done and they're good and, and uh, not, not only on getting all our equipment where it needs to be safely, confidentiality is an important thing for, for us, right? We're, we're all trying to take pictures of each other's cars and, uh, you know, they've got all our equipment. So uh, confidentiality, which has never been breached, uh, is also very important to us. So uh, it works uh, seamlessly and it's, uh, it's unbelievably impressive. I wouldn't want to deal with the stress of, because I just take for granted that we're leaving Brazil on Sunday night and we're going to be here on Wednesday. And, and I'm able to take it for granted because it always happens. Gosh, being behind the wheel, obviously you've been, you were behind the wheel for many years and doing what you're doing right now, what's more stressful? Um, doing what I'm doing now. Yeah. Uh, you feel a little bit less in, in control, so the you know it's a, it's a nervous excitement. You know the build up to a race, the the start of the race, that first lap, the pit stops, because so many things can go right or wrong in such a short period of time. Um, we have hundreds of millions of fans, big expectations, uh, great sponsor partners, and uh, you you feel the the weight of that when you're you know McLaren. It's like any other sport that the big teams. There's high expectations. So, um, and how do you, and how do you deal with that from a mental side of things? Uh, you know, you got to make decisions sometimes that your fans aren't going to like, but yeah. you know you have to do it. Like any good coach, that's what you have to do. I think all you can do, and this is something that the FIA, you know, and I think we all need to tackle social media, yeah. um, the the people that uh, voice their displeasure in, in a very um, uh, personal, way uh, personal, yeah, very much a personal way and, and unfair. You know, you don't mind the cheering and the booing at the, the football game. That's, that's the nature of, of sport. Um, but it's amazing some of the negativity that, that you, you hear. You, you never experience it in real life. They'll never do it to you personally. But they'll, they'll hide behind keyboards and, and, and do it. So I, I hope we can kind of clean that up and... Uh, um, but you know, as as one of the you know the biggest teams, we're the the second uh, most successful team in the in the history of Formula One. Our fans rightfully have high expectations, and I think all we can do is be very transparent, very honest of where we are on our journey. We have a, a new wind tunnel coming. We have a new simulator coming. So we're still catching up on some of our technology infrastructure. So as much as I'd love to sit here and go, we're racing for the championship next year. We're not championship ready yet we're a couple years away but i think we're better off being honest and transparent with our fans and having them come along on the journey with us and feeling that excitement of us growing than uh making a statement that you know they're just gonna in six months go oh wait a minute you you, you said you're gonna you're gonna win and um and it's tough you know because the the pace of development of a of a formula one team if you take the car that was on pole at the first race and you didn't touch it, it would be last by the end of the year. So that's the pace of development 
of a Formula One team. We pull down one and a half terabytes of data um, off of our two cars. We have 300 sensors per race weekend, and we run over 300 million simulations. So the pace of development is awesome, but all the racing teams are doing that. So, you know, we've got to, in order to catch up to the, the Red Bulls and the Mercedes, we need to outdevelop them, which is not easy to do, but uh, we'll get there. Uh, we won our, our first race in a while last year and, and pole and five podiums, so we're getting closer. And uh, I, I think our journey will be 23, should be stronger than this year. Uh, 24, I'd like to think we're, we're winning races. And in 25, I think once you're winning races, you can start doing it on a regular basis. I'd like to think 25, we're competing for the championship. Um, so that's that's kind of the three-year journey that we're on. I think the hon honesty is the best policy. Of course, with social media involved and doing the Netflix show, I think you, it's probably the best way to say, hey, we're here, but we're going to end up here, and we yeah. do it together. Um, we have a few more minutes here. I don't know if there's any questions in the crowd, but if anyone wants to ask in, in our audience here, we have a few hands up. I think we'll get the mic here. If, uh, if, if Zach and Stephen don't mind, we'll get a few questions here. Uh, we'll bring a microphone out to you. Uh, again, thank you guys. We really appreciate it. Give them both a big, we're not winding it up, but give them both a big round, round of applause here. Uh, Stephen Bing as well, thank you. From RPM Events Logistics and of course, Zach Brown. It's been an honor to have you guys here up on stage. I know it's a tremendous weekend as well. If we can just get a microphone out, just if you put your hand up again over here, we'll bring that microphone front row center. Just what's your name, where you're from? Hi, I'm Ankit. I'm from DP World itself. A little bit louder. A little bit louder for me. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ankit. I'm from DP World. Uh, and my question is to Zach. It's been a tough year for you. We have tough seen you sliding from fourth last year to fifth this year in the construction championships. Are you having some new strategies for the next year other than replacing Daniel? Sorry? Are there any other strategies for next year? Um, yeah, so th this year has been a, a, a difficult year. We were, we have a change of, of drivers, which is, you know, added to our challenge. We've, uh, Lando's had an, an, an exceptional year and uh, Daniel has is, is, is struggled. Um, so our, our drivers are further away in points from each other than most of the, the grid. So that's kind of compounded uh, the, the issue for, for us. Uh, we were fourth most of the year, then we slipped to fifth, then we went back to fourth. And Brazil was a pretty big bummer for us. They had a great race. Uh, we, we didn't. So I think coming into Abu Dhabi this weekend's a, a pretty tall order. Um, our car is well under development. What we need to do is get Oscar Piastri, our, our new young driver, uh, who we think is the next Lando, uh, up to speed as, as quickly as possible. He's had a year off from racing because he was a reserve driver, so that's a very important focus for us. Um, and then building on where we know we have our, our car deficiencies, some of that comes from us not being in, a, in, a, in our ideal wind tunnel at the moment so we can kind of pinpoint where we're still catching up on some of our technology infrastructure that that's some of the weakness in our on our race car but i'd like to think um we can uh you know fight for third fourth in the championship again uh i'd like to think that we'll get a uh, opportunity to, to to win a race or, or two and our pit stops now are are really strong and i think with uh, you know, any business that you're all in, just like us, it's all about incremental gains. So our pit stops four or five years ago were not very strong. We've now had the fastest pit stop, um, the second best team in pit stops. Our reliability up until this weekend has been pretty good. So we just need to keep taking incremental gains moving forward and, and be a strong team and really integrate Oscar, our new driver, into the team. Great answer. Thank you. Any other questions here? We have one more here on the, uh, on the right. Uh, hi, how are you? Franco Bossoni, DP World. Uh, question for Sack and, and Stephen. Um, you know, uh, most teams are based out of England, I think, for historic reasons, of course, when, when the uh, tournament was mostly European-based. As it's becoming more and more of a, a, a global sport, and, and obviously keeping the subject to freight, um, do you think in the future it's conceivable that we may see either teams relocate or maybe new teams come from other parts of the world, and you know, specifically since we're, we're here in Dubai, um, how does logistics and, and how would a, a team perhaps placed in a, in a part that's more centrally connected, uh, would that make a big difference or is that not really uh, something that factors in 
uh, when, when you think about team location? I think from a, a racing team standpoint, I think logistically you could run a racing team from about anywhere, right? Because we've only got one race in, in, in England. I think the biggest challenge in the short term would be uh, people and the suppliers are all kind of built up around the, the, the infrastructure. So if you were to move a, a racing team here or Bahrain or even America, it's going to be getting the... Uh, you know, we're a thousand employees in our on our operation who, you know, a lot obviously come from Formula One experience and other teams. So I think the people part would be the biggest challenge for setting up a team in kind of a, a new territory. I think logistic wise, I think you, you could do it quite easily because we're living on, you know, planes and we've even tried trains uh, this year to, to spa uh, to see how that would work from a sustainability uh, standpoint. So I think you could set it up anywhere. I think people would be your biggest challenge. Yeah, I, I agree with Zach. Um, I think logistically, you know, at the moment there's a benefit to having all of the teams originating from Europe because it allows everyone to go together to that first race. Um, you know, certainly with the the, the, the charters that Formula One operate out to the events. But, you know, logistically with the, with the right expertise and, and money, you can make anything happen. So, you know, I think, it, like Zach said, it'd be more, I think it'd be more difficult to find you know, the, 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 the people and the suppliers local to where the team is based, being that, you know, it's a, Formula One's got such a long history of teams originating in the, you know, or teams growing in the UK and Europe. Um, but yeah, from a logistics point of view, you know, there's globally there's the right infrastructure to make anything happen. It's just it's getting it done properly. Great answers, thank you. Uh, I've got time for one more, if there is. Otherwise, let me see. There is uh, probably just yeah, just to the back. Go to the back first, if you can. Uh, hi, my name is Vahaj. I'm from DP World. Uh, my question is for Zach. How the technology over the years has helped you to win the races? I mean, how you are optimizing the performance for, and I mean, you are yourself also is a professional driver. So how the technology has helped to improve the performance and make sure you win? Yeah, so, you know, we're, we're in the technology business, we're in the human performance business, and everything we do is uh, data driven. And what Formula One teams are doing, as I mentioned before, we've got all these sensors on the race car, we're pulling down all this data. What we're doing with our partners is how quickly can you, you know, it's one thing to get one and a half terabytes of data, what do you do with it? And how quickly can you react to it? Because we're making split second decisions. So uh, we've had connected cars for 20 years, right? That's kind of a newer phenomenon. We've been talking to our race cars on and off the track around the world. We've got the, the race really takes place in mission control back in, in England, even if we're in, in Australia. And uh, so now what we have is about 60 people back at the factory that all have, and communication is, is critical, someone who's looking at competitors, someone who's looking at weather, someone who's looking at uh, car reliability, someone who's looking at tire performance, and all this data is coming in, getting amalgamated, and we're having to understand that data and feed that data back to the, the, the pit wall. And those people need to make uh, data-driven decisions, and the better the data we get, the more accurate their decisions. There's this thing that's called kind of racer instinct, no different than, than business instinct, which you all have, which is you get some in, information, then it's kind of what, what does your gut and experience tell you? And when I'm on the pit wall, I've got a lot of data, but it's not my job to call the race. And probably nine out of 10 times when my racer instinct kicks in and we've made a decision, I'll, and, and let's say out of 10 times, I would question the, the call, uh, but I let them get on with it, nine times I'd be wrong. And that's because they've got data that they're seeing that's coming in from our different data providers and partners and deciphering that. And they're, they're just, they can see the race through technology and data 
differently than, than you could in the good old days where you had limited data, so you had no choice but to make kind of a race or instinct call. And uh, we can still get it wrong because data, um, it tells one side of the story. What it can't yet do is, you know, it can tell us when we might catch a driver in front, but it's going to be a race or instinct that knows Fernando Alonso is going to defend his position maybe differently than Sebastian Vettel is going to defend his position. And that's where your experience of knowing the racing environment, you kind of take that data, but then you know how that driver is, you know, under pressure, um, how well they handle tire deg. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a combination of racer instinct, but it's data technology driven. Great answer. Guys, we've run out of time, but I think there's the, uh, the title was, you know, getting to the 11th hour, I totally now understand and respect a lot more of what the Formula One is all about. And as it travels around the world, I'd like to thank you both for uh, joining us here. Please, Stephen and Zach, please give them a big round of applause for joining us here this afternoon. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having us.